opening sermon. I'm glad to be connected with you, as usual. Uh, during these times, a great time to uh, be a child of God. Prepared for what your Lord is doing. And I just thank God for his awesomeness and his faithfulness. And I thank God for his word and allowing us to have access to his word um, through the Holy Spirit's guidance and teaching us and showing us about the things of God. Giving all praise and honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of my life, and I know he's the Lord of yours. Um, and to my God, the one and only God, God who has the first and final say in all matters, regardless of what we may think. And I just thank God for his faithfulness. Thank God for the opportunity to be here with you today and to be a part of you guys' lives. And I'm just praying and I'm believing that uh, the Lord will share something with us today to continue to, continue to move us on as we seek to establish kingdom rule here on earth as we await our Lord and Savior's uh, return. As we know, he's preparing us for uh, what's to come next in our lives. With that said, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord God, Father, we just thank you. We praise you, dear Lord, for your guidance, your mercy, your grace. Uh, we thank you for your provision, dear Lord, uh, for prosperity, good health, and long life. We thank you for wisdom, Lord, knowledge, and understanding, uh, enlightening our minds uh, to your words, your will, and uh, growing us into a deeper knowledge and understanding of your power toward us. Uh, that resurrection power, dear Lord, that raised our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from the dead, uh, conquering death, dear Lord, with all power and authority. And Lord, granting us the right and opportunity to operate in that power and authority, we say thank you. But Lord, we consider it a privilege and an honor to be here today to hear a word from you, uh, to um, experience your love for us, dear Lord, and our desire is for you to experience our love for you. And Holy Spirit, we give you that free will to lead us into uh, serving God in spirit and in truth that he may experience our love. Lord, we ask you to touch our hearts and our minds that we move into a deeper knowledge and understanding of you and a greater love for you and one another, dear Lord, for a lost and dying world. Glorify yourself, Father. That's your power and authority. We pray and thank you, Lord, and we count it all done. Father, amen, amen. Praise be to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm excited, as usual, to be connected with you guys today. Uh, but like we said, it's nothing like being face-to-face. Uh, uh, and that time will come. But it's also important, you never know as we are today, uh, what situation you may find yourself in. And because of that, we must be prepared to transition into whatever situation uh, that the Lord unfolds each day. And I thank the Lord for allowing us uh, to be where we are today, how he's unfolded things as he's healing the land. Now we're gonna continue in our uh, sermon, we are in the book of Mark. And we we're talking about the demonic uh, possession of the young boy. And some insights on last week's lesson, uh, uh, we we're talking about the deaf mute spirit. And with some things that we learned about and to get some insights and highlights on what we talked about last week. Uh, one, we saw that uh, the deaf mute spirit, uh, it hinders your ability to hear, which affects the way you talk and understand. And we saw that in Hebrews 5, 11, where it looked at about uh, as we are moving in our walk with the Lord, uh, taking advantage of what he's teaching us and applying in our lives is to help us to be able to better understand the things of God. Uh, we also saw that uh, one of the influences of the demonic deaf spirit is that uh, it snatches away what's sown in your heart. Uh, because you can't hear, um, you can't receive. And there's some subtle ways in which this happens. You know, because God said that Satan was the most subtle of, the cre of his creation, of the creatures. You know, and so as we're coming into this lesson, we read about uh, the demonic possession, uh, as with the boy in the lesson that we are talking about. And we see all the drama and the violence of that experience, which gets the attention. You know, meanwhile, if you're not really paying attention, uh, there's a more devastating aspects of demonic possession, deaf mute spirit, uh, that will go unnoticed. 
Uh, and we talked about last week how we are born with a deaf, mute spirit, the influence of it. When we come into this world, we are born deaf and mute uh, to the things of God. And when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, as our Lord and Savior, we start a process of moving away from that condition. Um, but we need to be real careful because uh, as we look at the demonic possession, that physical experience, um, the violence and the trauma that comes with it, if we're not careful, we'll get focused on that. And that picture becomes uh, seared in our mind when we start talking about demonic possession, uh, possession and being influenced by the enemy uh, as we are in this time right now, as God is actually healing the land, uh, fulfilling the prophecy that he's made to us and in line with uh, fulfilling his word, keeping his word, uh, we're going through a <clears throat> healing process. But just like with the demonic possession, we can get caught up on the process. As we saw the boy that, you know, when the demon would seize him, he would roll across the ground and foam at the mouth. And you know, sometimes he would throw him in the fire to uh, try to make him destroy himself or throw him in the river to uh, drown him. And that would take your attention, but there's a lot of other subtle influences in the spirit realm. And a lot of those influences impact us the most indirectly because we're looking so much at that thing uh, that's he wants to get our attention. It's like a magician. You know, they, they are able to carry out the magic tricks that they um, carry out a lot of times because of what we call distraction or reflecting. They'll get you to look at one thing while all the time they're carrying on their hokey dokey when you're not looking. And unfortunate to say, that's what's going on in the religious community today. As God is moving in the land, um, People can't seem to recognize nothing but what the enemy wants them to see. So we look at all the stuff that's going on, all the influences that the enemy has on people's behavior that's not lining up with, uh, with showing love and, and, and thought of others and, and just good sense judgment. You know, um, That's what the enemy wants you to focus on. And it'll have you talking about people and the circumstances and the situations, but you're going to miss the real thing that what God is doing. Uh, and this, detract, this distraction becomes um, the thing that does more harm than good. See, and it's like the scripture when it teaches about that some people are like the seed uh, sown along the path uh, where, where the word is sown. And it says, as soon as as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. God has told us in his word what he's going to be doing. Uh, that if you turn from your wicked ways, humble yourselves and pray that he'll heal the land. He didn't say how many. He just said if you did that, his people. And when his people do that, whether it's one or a million, he has to honor his word. Because Jesus died just for me. If no one else got saved but me it would have been still worth his while and he would have still done it. So the enemy, because we are born deaf to the word of God, he does everything he can to prevent us from receiving it. And he has a lot of ways of doing that. God is trying to get a message to his people now. And the more God moves to get a message, the more Satan rolls you around on the ground and has you foaming at the mouth and, and you missed what God is trying to tell you. And so others are like the seed that are sown on rocky places. Uh, they hear the word, and once they receive it with joy, you hear the word that God is going to give, you receive it with joy, but then you get seized by the enemy. And says that um, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others are like seeds sown in rocky places. They hear the word and at once receive it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. Since they have no training in the word of righteousness and obedience to God's word, they can't stand the onslaught. 30 days in, <laughs> people are out going mad because the wording that we use, stuck in my home, 
locked in with my family. Those words carry a lot of power because uh, they denote a negative about what you're doing. When in turn, it's just God answering prayer. How often have we said we don't have the time that we really need for our families? We don't have time to take care of these projects. We don't have time to do this and this and thus around the home. So God is answering prayers. He's giving people time. People have been complaining about uh, air pollution. So he's cleaned the air. There's no vehicles out there. Never has our environment been this clean. Companies polluting the rivers and things of that nature and global warming. He's answering all these prayers, but we had no idea how he would answer them. And as he's answered them, he has, as the enemy has seized people and they are now rolling across the ground, foaming at the mouth, you know, uh, self-destruct behavior, uh, doing things that they know is not good for them because they are not experiencing anything negative at the time. Uh, I heard a quote they were saying that, you know, we're quarantining the people that are sick and let all of us that are well go out free. Uh, my God, my God, foaming at the mouth, not even realizing that the very freedom you said you wanted to live is the very freedom that's going to kill you uh, because you can't recognize God is answering prayer. You know, um, that some, they have no root, and when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The word tells you to be submissive and obedient, you know, but it, it's just not bringing about what you want, so you rebel and you fight. Uh, because the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And unfortunately, uh, during this time, because of this deaf mute spirit's influence over our society, um, we realize that people have not really heard and understood the word of God. Time is now going to reveal who your God really is. What do you really depend on uh, for your success? What are you really depending on to be all right. God says you can't serve uh, God and money. You're going to hate one, despise the other, or love one, or hate the other. And as we are coming to these times, uh, people are desperate because they haven't gotten to know God for who he really is in their personal lives. Uh, they can tell you about what he's done for Paul and Peter and David and Moses and all of the others, uh, but they can't seem to have their own story that will allow them to trust God and what he's doing during these times. So what about you? And we like I said, we're in the book of Mark. Um, you know, it's just been, uh, I guess, sobering, I guess that's the word as uh, we observe these times that we're in and we are seeing professing believers response to the times, it's been sobering to see how very little people know God for themselves. How little people really trust in God in any situation uh, that he's gonna be faithful to his word. Uh, God said he will provide for you. He will bless the things you put your hand to. Uh, but keep it in its proper perspective, is always tied into if you obey me. And so many people want to serve God, but they don't want to obey him. And these are the times that will reveal who really does trust God. Who's willing to lose it all to stay in obedience to God and allow God to experience your love for him? And that's a question I think we believe, I believe that we all need to ask ourselves. How far am I willing to go? How much am I willing to lose? 
How much am I willing to suffer to drive out this deaf, mute spirit in my life and its influence so that I can truly hear God, so I can truly speak the language of God, the kingdom of God during times like this, that I can really communicate uh, and understand what God is actually doing so that my heart and my mind can be protected. It's the only way it's going to be protected. And these are the things that we need to talk about as we're going to finish up, I will not finish up, continue in the book of Mark as we're dealing with the demonic spirit, uh, the deaf mute spirit in the possession of the young lad. We're in Mark chapter 9, and we started off at verse, um, well, I'll just start off from the beginning. It says, um, when they came back to the disciples, uh, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately when the entire crowd saw him, uh, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit, which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? O oh, how long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion, and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he was dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up. When he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Amen. This kind can come out by anything other than prayer. So what is Jesus saying? And to pick this story up in his chronological state and how it happened, uh, because Jesus is our example, and he's telling them that this kind can only come out uh, through prayer. Uh, let's go back to Jesus as he's going through this process and pick it up from there, which will require us to go down to 29, verse 29, where he talks about how it comes out. Because if that's how it comes out, we must assume, because Jesus is our example, that that's what he did. Keep it in mind that Jesus is a man just like you, just like me. He was empowered with the Holy Spirit um, because he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit came to dwell inside of him. And the scripture teaches us that it was the Spirit that was with Jesus that empowered him to heal and do the things that he's done. Well, that same Spirit dwells within us, dwells within you, dwells within me, if you are truly born again and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So Jesus is our example. So let's go through his example as he's going through this process so we can see what it looks like. Because he says, this kind only comes out through prayer. And, and I don't know about you, when I hear the word prayer, uh, a lot of times I think about that intimate time that I set aside to talk to God personally when I'm in my closet uh, with no disruptions. 
Um, but when you're moving through your day each day, we want to know what praying looks like um, as we are talking to God, because he tells us always be praying. Uh, you know, if you got this process, and sometimes most of us do, uh, we want to understand that because of the divine way of God and how he does things, uh, the different methods that he's used, we have to understand how to take what God has taught us and use it in a practical way as we move through life each day. So with that said, let's go to verse 29. It says, Jesus tells the disciples that this kind can only come out with prayer. Prayer means having conversation with God. Why does this re situation require pr prayer or talking to God? It all has to do with the sovereignty of God. See, in the sovereignty of God, God, the sovereignty of God means that God rules over all creation. Nothing happens unless God causes it to happen or allows it to happen. In his sovereignty, God says, this is what I want to happen. Or he says, this is not what I want to happen, but I'm going to allow it to happen to cause what I want to happen to happen. Not only must you understand the sovereignty of God, you must also understand the providential working of God. Providence is the method God uses to do his ruling. Uh, providence is where God brings uh, together different events and circumstances in order to accomplish his sovereign will. This is important because we don't want to find ourselves fighting against God. Acts 5.39 deals with that when Jesus had come on the scene and the Pharisees had, scribes had come together to put a plot together uh, to kill Jesus. And one of them said, listen, now we've had a lot of people coming here pretending that they were the Messiah. And they, they created followings. And people followed them. And they, it all burned out. They either got killed or got destroyed. He said, but listen, you might want to suck and guess messing with this guy called Jesus. He said, because if God is with him, ain't nothing you can do to stop it. And if God is not with him, it's going to self-destruct itself. He said, because you don't want to find yourself fighting against God. That's very important to understand because of the methods in which God uses to carry out his will, a lot of things will look like they're not of God, but if God is sovereign, he has allowed it to happen. Because of the knowledge you have of God, a situation could look a certain way and be in line with what the word says and could be something entirely different from what God is doing. Uh, example is 1 Samuel 16, 14. It says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Wait a minute. The spirit of God <laughs> departed from God, from Saul. But then an evil spirit came from God to go torment Saul. Now, when you look at that situation, when David is playing for Saul to soothe him, that evil spirit that came from God lead Saul to pick up a spear to try to stab David with it and it said pin him against the wall. Now you know good and well that ain't nothing but the devil from our perspective. But see this is the thing. We profess to be children of God. God allows the devil to do a lot of things sometimes to us just to see, will it prove that we truly are who we say we are? David could have took offense. These are, could, could have been some of the very things that he could have held in his heart by believing that Saul was controlled by the devil. He knew he was out of line with God. So God wants me to kill him the first chance I get because he's trying to kill me. See, that's the way the fallen mind works. But David knew who God was. He understood that Saul was in position because God had put him in position. And he knew to obey God, he had to give Saul respect and honor. So he ran from Saul all these years. Saul was out to kill him. 
David had opportunities to kill him, but said, you should not put your hands on God's anointed, proving that he truly had the heart of God. What about you when you've got a Saul trying to kill you? How do you respond? What do you say about that situation? Who is behind that? God is sovereign. And because of his divine ways of doing things, he uses everything for his use, even the wicked, even coronavirus, even all the evil that you see going on. It's just to reveal who the true child of God is. Whether they really get influenced by the Holy Spirit or that deaf, mute spirit that can't hear God, therefore can't talk like God's people talk. And because he can't talk like God's people talk, he can't understand like God's people need to understand. So they are blinded to God at work right in their very eyes. Who you think are in charge of things right now? Another situation, Judges 9, 23. Then God, then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Sechem. And the men of Sechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. God sends an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Sechem to have them fighting at each other. Mm, that was God? Mm. That's something to think about because God is divine. He's sovereign and he's providential. I mean, he uses any method necessary to allow you to prove who you really are. Satan is not off the chain. It is not man. It is God who has a divinely orchestrated plan to reveal who his people are and who those that are imposters pretending they're gods when they're not. What has this shutdown done for you? What is it really telling about you? If I listen to you and see what you do, would it reveal the character of God? Or would it reveal that you are being influenced by demonic spirits? God sent those evil spirits. God sent Saul into Jerusalem, breathing fire and killing the Christians and having them locked up. But that was the only way God could get the Christians to do what he told them to do. Go out into all the region and spread his word. But things were so good in Jerusalem, God was in, moving to such a high time, as they say, nobody wanted to leave. We need to learn how to move when the sun is shining, when things are running great, to move on to what God has called us to do so he don't have to run us. Job 1.9 says, then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for naught? Has thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Notice what Satan said. Because God had asked him, Satan, where you been? Moving back and forth. He said, Had you considered my servant Job, that he's the most honorable, faithful man in the land? Satan so said, I guess I, I see why. He ain't got no reason not to be. You done blessed everything he put his hands on. You got to protect it from me and everything that's, that would cause him, that would challenge him and his faith for you. But this was deep. Satan said, you, you God, you put forth your hand on him and he'll curse you for your face. I mean, that Satan even know, look, I ain't nobody. Anything that go on, you have to okay it. You have to allow it or do it. He said, you, God, put your hand on him and all that he has, and he will curse you before your face. God said, okay, you can do it. 
I'll give you permission to do it. That's how it works, people. But Satan got us rolling around on the ground, foaming at the mouth, and grinding our teeth and digging our heels in. Because he got us focused on the circumstances. Circumstances that have been created because he has been allowed by God to bring about this so that we will blaspheme against God and say that the work of God is now the work of Satan. Mm, mm, mm. See, it's your perspective of God that's going to impact your perspective on life. See, God is just testing you. Satan is tempting you. Tempting you to give him credit for what God is doing or what God has allowed only to prove who you are. Because you are in courtroom every day. Satan is standing before God accusing you of being a liar, unfaithful, recognizing him as your God and him as the one that dictates what goes on in life. That's his plan. That's why he was created. He was allowed to become. God uses everything for his own purpose. He's the greatest CEO or manager of all time. He does not micromanage. He trusts what he's created to do what he's supposed to do when he's supposed to do it. Put forth, you put forth your hand against Job, God, and he'll curse you before your face. God said, go ahead and do what you may, but one thing, don't touch his body. Only, only upon himself, put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And we know the deal after that. He went through, Job said, naked I came in, naked I go out. Wife said, go on, and no, that was afterwards. So he goes back, he goes back again and touches his body. And you know the deal. Wife said, come out and said, go and curse God and die. Job said, I took the good, I got to take the bitter, because God is still in charge. God made everything for his own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. You see, because of this knowledge, Jesus understanding God and how he works. When he runs upon the demonic possessed boy, he didn't get excited and felt he needed to rush in and let's do something. Because remember, as soon as the spirit saw Jesus, he tried to get some distraction going on. Made the boy roll around on the ground, foaming at the mouth. Jesus just looking at him and asked questions. Hey, God. Hey, Dad, how, how long has this been going on? See, Jesus is now surveying the scene as Nehemiah examining the wall. He's checking out where the breaches are in the wall and what needs to be repaired before he rushed in because it looks like such an emergency at the moment. But while he's talking to the man, he's talking to God. He's analyzing the scene. How long has this been going on? Since his birth, since he was a young child. And he is now at this time talking to God because he said this kind only comes out by prayer. Prayer is just having a conversation with God. So he's asking the proper question. How long has this been going on? Man tells him, tells him how the spirit treats him during this process. And through his proper analysis and talking to God, God is telling him what to do. That's what praying to God looks like. It's talking to God about what you're seeing. Imagine you and your brother, you and your sister, you and your spouse, uh, you, you go to bone a situation and you advise it. Don't you talk to each other like, my God, you see that? Man, I wonder what's going on. I wonder if anybody hurt. Oh God, what should we do? Well, you talk to God the same way. You don't just rush in because you don't know what's going on. You want to get some information, and now you can take that information now and apply that information with your knowledge and your understanding, and you discern what you are able to do. 
And once determining what you're able to do, you proceed accordingly. God expects us to come to him that same way, which brings us to our, first, our third principle. You cannot depend on past success when you're walking with God. You know, the disciples had been given authority earlier to cast out demons and heal the sick. So because of how things worked the last time, well, well, this is what we do. You must seek God's counsel before you do anything, regardless of your past experiences or how familiar you may think you are with that particular situation. John 5, 19 and 20 says, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. So what do we gather from all of this information? If this word be true, if Jesus said he don't do anything unless God tell him first, or unless he see God's doing it, that means that he didn't cast out this demon until he first talked to God. God showed him what needed to be done because the boy was possessed. Now God has to tell him what he wanted him to do. And not just with the demon-possessed boy because he said this kind. Jesus is talking about demonic spirits in general. They come out through prayer. Everything you do comes out through prayer. That's what we have to remember. So how does this relate to the disciples not being able to cast out the demon? And as I said, as Jesus, Jesus had given them authority to uh, cast out demons. So what had happened? It was for that particular assignment that he had gave them. He gave them authority to go out and cast out demons and heal the sick. That was an assignment. And they came back and reported. So if you want to walk with God daily, you cannot depend on past success. You must ask God each day and each experience for fresh guidance. Let's look at an example, First Chronicles 14. First Chronicles 14, eight through 15. Let's look at an example of what we are talking about. Because we as people have a tendency that once we've experienced something, we kind of set that as the mode of the process. First Chronicles 14, 8 through 15, it reads, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, the Philistines went up in search of David, and David heard of it and went out against them. Now the Philistines has come and made a raid in the valley of Rephidim. David inquired of God, saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? And will you give them into my hand? Then the Lord said to him, Go up, for I will give them into your hand. So they came up to uh, Belperazim, Bel Bel and David defeated them there. And David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like the breakthrough of waters. Therefore, they named that place Belperazim. They abandoned their gods there. So David gave the order, and they were burned with fire. The Philistines made yet another raid in the valley. David inquired again of God, and God said to him, You shall not go up after them. Circle around behind them and come at them in front of the balsam trees. It shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then you shall go out to battle. For God will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. 
David did just as God had commanded him, and they struck down the army of the Philistines from Gibeon, even as far as Gezer. Gezer. Then the fame of David went out into all the lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him on the nation. See, and, and this is what Jesus said. I don't do anything unless I hear God tell me, or I see him doing it. Now, David had already talked to the Lord about the Philistines. The Philistines were their enemy. David asked God, should I go out? God said, go out and get them, and I'm going to make sure you win. Now, if you are influenced by a deaf, mute spirit, and you are prone to getting stuck and putting God in a box. You and I probably would have, if the Philistines, if we had, had attacked us and we've gone against them and defeated them because we know, we know we talked to God and God told us to do this. Then they turn right around a little later and make another attack. You ain't going to talk to God because God done already told you what to do when it comes to the Philistines. You're going to go out just like you did the last time, and you're going to get shellaxed, defeated. That's a word from the old school. Because you thinking God's still operating like he did the last time because you don't understand the providential working of God. Just because he did something this way in that same situation does not go and mean he's going to do the same thing with the same situation the next time. This is the evidence of that. You must ask God each day, each experience for fresh guidance. You need a fresh word for a fresh experience. Even though it's the same situation, it is a new experience because it's a different time. Isaiah 55, 89. Why must we consult God each time when we're dealing with the same situation? Because God is providential and everything that's happening in your life is an opportunity to get to know God and how he works. And there's nothing no worse than assuming you know somebody because you've had one or two encounters with them. It's nothing no worse than thinking you know somebody because you've been living with them for 20 years. Only thing that you can say about that 20 years is that you know how they act in certain situations at certain times. You can have that same situation tomorrow and get a totally different response. And that's what causes a lot of problems. There's nothing no dangerous than dealing with someone that thinks they know you. And that's really bad because what they know of you today might not be you tomorrow if God is transforming you. And it's our blindness by that deaf, mute spirit that prevents us from seeing what God is doing in one another's lives and our circumstances because we've been locked into the last experience. And it's preventing us from getting a fresh new experience with God and the people we know because we don't want to allow them to be what they're becoming because of what they were and how it influenced you. Because we have put God and ourselves in a box. The subtle influence of a deaf, mute spirit. You are changing in front of people doing different behavior and they still try to see you as that last behavior that they didn't realize you've been delivered from. Even though the proof is right there, you didn't do like you normally did, but because it was the same similar situation, they already in their mind see and hear what they've been programmed to hear and see because they don't talk to God. God, I've been praying for this person to change. I see change, but they ain't changed. They saying they changed, but they ain't changed. 
They ain't doing it the same, but they ain't changed. Because your mind sees everything based on that distraction that the enemy is making you look at. And you can't even see the real thing that God is doing right before your eyes. Because you've been hoodwinked, damaged by that mute, deaf spirit. Got you grinding your teeth, rolling around on the ground, foaming at the mouth. Live it, because you can't see the very change right before your eyes. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. You cannot depend on past success and experiences with God as the way for tomorrow or today. That was yesterday. Today is the day, a new fresh experience. And you might be saying because of that deaf mute spirit, man, nothing changed. I'm going through the same thing day in and day out. That's because you're not talking to God to see what he wants to do with this thing today, even though it looked like the same thing you had yesterday. See, yesterday is supposed to be preparing you for tomorrow. Not like Groundhog Day where you wake up and you repeat every day over and over again. And most of us are like that movie, Groundhog Day. We wake up every day repeating the same thing we did yesterday because we refuse to talk to God to see what he wants to do in this day with the same thing that we had yesterday. Deaf mute spirit has so many subtle ways of influencing the way we think and how we view God, how we view ourselves, how we view life, how you viewing what you are dealing with now. And everybody's talking about, I want yesterday to return. That's what they're saying. Things go back to normal. Normal wasn't working. That's why God had to intercede. He's trying to point us in a new direction, a new way, his way. Where are you focused? What are you hoping happen? Are you hoping things get back to normal? That's the evidence of a deaf, mute spirit that is influencing the decisions that you make. Let's wake up. Let's see God. Let's talk to God. Let's hear God to see what he's doing and what he wants us to do involved with it. In verse 25 to 27, Jesus, after talking to God and seeing a crowd rapidly gathering, Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. Jesus rebuked the spirit. This is all part of the process. Very important, because he's talked to God now. And he knows how to deal with the spirit, because God has told him what he's doing. This means that Jesus expressed severe disapproval of the unclean spirit for not keeping his own domain and possessing the boy. See, God did not create humans to be possessed by demons. But because of the providence of God, we know that's true. Jesus said, let's talk to dad at first and see what he's doing. Because I know that ain't how he do things. I mean, that, I know this boy being possessed is not God's way. But because I know my God, he allows a lot of things to happen for a lot of different reasons. So let me consult him before I try to put a label on what I see going on. So I can find out what he's doing. Because sometimes we can see things that we know is not what God does. We automatically think we know the answer. No, you don't, because you don't know your God like that. These are situations that are going to help you to get to know your God like that and how he does and why he does what he does. So he's talked to God. So after talking to God, it says he rebukes the spirit. 
And to rebuke means that you express severe disapproval of their behavior. The issue is you have no business being in this board. Then he identifies the spirit. You unclean spirit. He commanded the demon and the young boy to come out and not to enter him again. This is what it looks like to enforce your authority forcibly driving out an enemy. I rebuke you. He rebuked him. Physical removal because he now knows what God is doing. And we talked about enforcing your authority. That's what it looks like. He's talked to God. He's got clear instructions from his commander and what he's doing. Now he's going in aggressively. He has forcibly commanded that enemy to come out. And see, and let's keep in mind now, this is very important. During Jesus' day, there were exorcisms always going on by the religious leaders. And very few were successful. That's why the people, as they saw Jesus moving about, they made statements like, he operates with authority, something they'd never seen before. See, Jesus has come to set the captives free. You, me, us, and the whole world, he's come to set us free. Free from Satan's rule. Matthew 12, 22 to 29. Matthew 12, 22 through 29. It's, then a demon possessed man was blind and mute, was brought to Jesus, and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out, if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Well, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who is not gathered with me scatters. You see, casting out demons was nothing new in the minds of the people. It was the results that were amazing. And so when Jesus sees the people coming, um, he hurries up moves on with his business. You see, God has given all creation boundaries to work and to exist within. Acts 17, 7, 25 and 26 and Jude 1 through 6, where God talks about how the angels, the spirits that did not keep their proper boundaries, they didn't stay in their lane. God had put those in chains, and that was those during Noah's day and prior, where fallen demons, angels were interacting with mankind in a way that God didn't intend. So God, when he destroyed the world, put them in chains, and they're being held until the day of judgment. But even in this new world after everything was destroyed. We still have fallen angels, demons, uh, that operate on Satan's behalf. And they still have the ability 
uh, to possess humanity, uh, to carry out Satan's plan. However, it's important to understand that God has created boundaries that he doesn't allow us to go outside of. You find it in Acts 17, 25, as I said, however, God is sovereign and works providentially as we said earlier. So upon talking to God, praying to God, Jesus has learned that God allowed this to happen to display his power. See, God allows things to happen that are not what he wants to happen to bring about what he wants to happen. And this season of Jesus' time, he's come to show God's authority and power over Satan and his realm. So in his divine orchestrated plan of life, God has allowed things to happen based on our nature and our character and our lives, whether it is in line with God or out of line with God, to bring about the opportunity for God to do what he's doing for the season. This is the season to show that God is greater than Satan and all his demons. So he's allowed the demonic spirit to possess the young boy. And in this process, he's talked to Jesus. And now Jesus is to cast out the demon in the boy. How do I know this? God's word. John 5, 19 and 20 says, therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly as I told you before, I can do nothing on my own unless it is something he sees the father doing or what the father is telling him to do. These are the things that Jesus does. He, Jesus said, I don't do anything unless it's what God has told me to do or I see him doing it. And even in what I see him doing it, he has to have been giving me instructions on how to deal with it. He said, because the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. Whatever that you bind in earth has already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. It was obvious that Jesus did not want the crowd to witness him casting out the demon. Why? Because during, like I said, during this time, exorcisms are popular. And the religious leaders of that day, as well as today, do what they do in the name of the Lord for show and popularity. Jesus deals with this principle in Matthew 6, 1 through 6. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Because if that's what you do, you have your full reward now. Unfortunately, in the religious realm, just like then, there are those who are howlings who have not been called by God. And they are trying to use the, the platform of church and kingdom of God as a way of gaining popularity and building a name for themselves. Uh, that's not my God. That's not how he does things. And that's why Jesus constantly was doing things and not wanting people to know. To let us know this is not about a show. This is not about impressing people. It is about doing the work that God is doing, working hand in hand with God, because we are God's representatives in this physical realm. And we're gonna be the only God that people sees through working through us, which brings us to our fourth principle. You must command the spirits. When we're talking about demonic spirits, unclean spirits, you must command the spirits. When the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing any harm. And amazement came upon them all, and they began teaching, talking with one another, saying, what is this message? For with authority 
and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out with authority and with power. Not just words, the exorcist was using words, but they could sense and see the power by the influence that it brought to the situation and the circumstances. It's the power of God being, being recognized in your circles of influence. When God is moving you about, allowing you to engage in people and circumstances and situations, it's the power of God being revealed that those that are around can see it and can experience. They said it's with authority and power. He commanded him to come out. It was something about the way he said it that they knew he had authority. It's like a, a police officer, not, not those ones that undermine their authority because they want you to like them. Um, state patrolmen do it well. It's some about when they approach you. It's just, it's like the foolishness goes out the window. Even if you are around them in a restaurant or something, I don't know about you, but it's me. I mean, because I've been in those environments. I'm kind of a laughy, like the joke type of guy. It's something about the way they present themselves that cut that stuff right off. I know it does with me. I mean, you know, and I think I'm pretty good at trying to loosen people up and let them lower their, uh, their guard. But, but it was, it's some of them, when I'm with them, it's just, no, it's like, this guy's examining you. You might be some kind of crook or something. He's, you know, it's like, you say, well, what this guy got going on? Now, why is he, you know, is he hiding something? And it just kind of puts you in a place of, hey, you know what? This guy's all about business. See, as a child of God, that's how the spirit realm is supposed to view you. This guy's about business. And you find yourself being careful of what you say. I do. I find myself being careful of what I say around them. It's like, man, this guy might start investigating me. They might think something I said sounds suspicious. You know what I'm saying? Because it's all the way they carry themselves. I'm on the job. I'm analyzing every person that come up to me because they could be a potential crook or criminal. And I'm here to get them. Even though you know you're not one. It's something about the way they present themselves, even if they know you well. It's like they act like they don't know you, even though they acknowledge you. That's the way we're supposed to be as servants of God. It's with authority and a power they commanded him to come out. And it says, and the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding districts. You must, I must, we must operate in the proper state of mind as servants of God. We're not clowns. We're not jokesters. We're not here to make you feel well about your state. We're here to help set you free from the things that bind you, because you might not even know you bound. You might not even know you need deliverance. But in our presence, these are the things that you're supposed to recognize yourself. Not by us telling you, but by learning the language of the kingdom, because we're not deaf and we're not mute. We're able to talk to you in such a way that helps you discover you got a problem. If we bow our business, if we operate in authority, if it's God that people is experiencing through us. What about you? How do people receive you? Are you allowing people the privilege of being to recognize their own shortcomings in their relationship with God without trying to tell them what they are? Because it's only self-discovery about ourselves that will make us or influence us to be encouraged to move forward and change or decide that change is not what we want. We must approach every situation actively, aggressively, on the attack. 
This means that Satan's resistance to maintain his ground will not prevail against us, because that's what God told Peter. It's upon this rock, this principle, that I am uh, the son of God with authority. That's what I'm going to build my church on. And the gates of hell would not be able to stand against your aggressive movement to drive Satan's influence out of your life and the lives of others. His resistance will be futile because greater is he that is in me, in you, in us than he that is in the world. First John 4.4. 4. That means that as we are going about establishing the kingdom of God here on earth, the enemy will not prevail against our efforts to, in his efforts to prevent us, Matthew 16, 17 through 19. Those possessed by demonic, demonic spirits are those you must snatch out of the fire to save their souls. That's in Jude 1, 22 through 23. This young man was possessed by a demonic spirit. He couldn't talk, he couldn't hear. That means there was no reach in his mind, his heart. But in with authority, because you recognize that it's a demonic spiritual condition. And not everyone that's, that has these issues are demonically possessed, but even if they're not possessed, that influence is from the fall. Even if they have a chemical imbalance or some going off in their body, all these things came in after the fall. That was not the way God created things to be. But because of man's free will and choosing to disobey God, God allowed these things to happen but it's not his way. Jesus came to undo all of that. Now we have an option. We just have to have a clear understanding of our God, the season that we are in, and why he has us here. Understanding what Jesus accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection. Rising from the grave, conquering death obtaining all power and authority over all of creation, over every name that could be named, to set things straight, to put them back like God intended them to be. Starting that process, a process that you and I are supposed to be completing until he returned or we leave here. Establishing kingdom rule here on earth. As we move about our work, there are going to be those that we're going to just have to aggressively snatch out as this situation with the demonic boy. But you won't know who, what situation that is until you first talk to God about what you're encountering. Ask him what he's doing and what he will have you to do. Because you're going to be talking to God based on the word that you have and know. But because you know he's a providential God, he does things in so many different ways, I can never assume that this is what he wants me to do in this situation, regardless of what I know about God. There is the revealed will of God, and there's the unrevealed will of God that he gives you as needed to deal with your situation. Why? Because God wants you to know that you need to always be coming to him regardless of what your last experience was. Because we will get to the point where we will start operating on past experiences and stop encountering God because the situation looks so familiar. Because we've been blinded by that deaf mute spirit that we were born into this world controlling us. That we won't be getting new information from God on every situation, every single day. Because it's like too much work. We grown, right? We don't need to ask him everything. We got common sense, we got a brain. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly why you need to engage God. 
because that brain and knowledge will fool you to make you think you're somewhere uh, that you're not. Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire, hating even the garment that they are polluted with showing mercy and fear that you don't find yourself getting caught up. Why? Because we have been given the kings, the keys of the kingdom, power and authority to carry out God's will. What are you doing? How are you doing? And it's unfortunately unfortunate, but God has allowed it to be the way, this way, one of the most unfortunate things about humanity, it does its best under pressure for some odd reason. There's something about success, things going well, that doesn't inspire us to pursue better to reach higher heights, to move deeper. And it's because the fallen nature lacks comfort. It lacks ease. One of the biggest challenges I, I struggle with in my uh, seeking to be self-controlled in all aspects of my life, especially with my health, my weight, and stuff of that nature, uh, you get to this this place where you really feel great. You know, you've, you've, you've gotten to a place of, that you've never been, your, your weight is in line with where you wanna be, your, your health is good, um, your, 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 your stamina is good, your energy level is good, um, life is just good, you know, you just feel great. But in that greatness, man, you just want to be, I like to wake up more and it's like, man, don't want to work out because I just, I like this feeling of waking up, feeling great, just set back, nothing to do. And it's like, man, this is great. And it becomes a challenge to go do the very things that got you there. It's, it's something about the fallen nature that when it gets to a certain level of comfort, a certain level of stability and security, it really wants to just chill and enjoy the moment. You know, it's like, I find myself like, man, you know what, you, you know you should be exercising, right? Yeah, but man, this feels good. I'll get it later. You know, you should ride your bike, right? Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna do it later. But it's just that moment. You just want to break it. You just want to like suck it in. Like, man, this is really, I like this. This is life. It's like, man, there's no problems. That's very dangerous. That's a dangerous place to be. Because the motivation to get better becomes a challenge. It becomes a a disruption, really an annoyance. Why are you going to interrupt? This is what life is about. And, and your mind be like, if I could just lock myself in right here, doing it like this, and it didn't take me to a negative place, I do it. And the Lord knows that about us. And the enemy knows that about us. And it's in these places we can be blind, come deaf to the Holy Spirit telling us, get up, go, get better, continue to improve. This is what's gonna take you back if you stay here long enough. And we fight. But you have to love God and truly love yourself to know that these are things that you must do because God has given you the keys of the kingdom. That is a spirit that he's letting you know you need to fight this spirit of comfort and joy and, 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 and ease because it is not a good place to stay. It's okay to enjoy, 
but enjoy it in the process of doing what you're supposed to be doing. And we have the tendency to choose one over the other, which is what that deaf mute spirit does. It tries to blind us uh, and keeps us from hearing from God the importance of continuing to move forward. You need to understand, now that you know who God created you to be, you need to understand how to operate in your kingdom power and authority to accomplish what God has called us to do. Therefore, in order to carry out God's will for your life, you must first establish your God-given kingdom authority that was secured for us as believers by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You must understand what authority you have and how to operate in it. This is crucial since God's authority is the only authority that Satan and his demons will submit to. Your acceptance of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior guarantees that the principalities and powers have already submitted to your God-given authority. Authority is the key because your character is not measured uh, by impressiveness of words, but in the power of life. As a believer, your God-given authority qualifies you to establish kingdom rule here on earth as we await Jesus' return. Operating in kingdom authority is the missing piece in the religious communities, our struggle against Satan and his dark forces. Kingdom authority. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you cannot be possessed by demonic spirits. However, you can be influenced by them. Because even though you are born again, the only thing that got saved at that point was you spirit. Your soul was not saved. And when God breathed his breath in you, you became a living soul. That's what this fight and this walk is all about. Delivering your soul from the influence of Satan. So that your soul craves and seeks after God. Satan will continue to influence you in every way that he can to follow his agenda because it knows it keeps your soul bound. That's what God says, what is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? You spirit was saved. But the completion of your salvation will not happen until Jesus return. If you have endured until his return or until you leave here in serving God in spirit and in truth. That's the evidence that you were truly born again. Because when you die, the spirit will go back to be with God. That breath that he breathed in you, but your soul that part of you, that consciousness of you, that portrays, protrudes who you are, will either end up in hell or in heaven. That's on you, your soul. And if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a candidate for demonic possession. You are already under demonic influence because of your birth. You were born under that influence. And the only way free is through accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, asking him to come into your life, asking God to forgive you and lead you in a way that glorifies him. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this will be a great time to do so. This would assure you that you won't find yourself like this little boy, demonically possessed, not able to control any aspects of your life. And having the resources you need to move away from his influence or to serve the true and living God, to enjoy the quality of life that God created us to enjoy, to be a living witness for God here on earth, uh, the world will know that there is a better way because they see you as the better way as they look at your lifestyle. I don't know where it's 
sermon finds you at the day, but I hope it finds you really thinking about how you are influenced in your mind and your heart, which will be revealed how you view life, how you view the things that are going on, and how you really examine yourself about what's really controlling you. Thank God for the Holy Spirit and dwelling. He gets me off of the sofa and he puts me on my bike. Uh, he gets me up and he makes me exercise. He makes me continue to do the things that are better for me and my desire, desire to serve God in spirit and in truth. But I tell you, it's work for him. Because whether we realize it or not, Satan is one of the most subtle of God's creation. And he has subtle ways of influencing us into self-destruct behavior, as you saw with the young boy. We will find ourselves making decisions that are self-destructive. We know we should be saving money, but we are spending money. We know we should be taking advantage of these times uh, to be with our families, to build a stronger family unit. Uh, but our minds have us restless. We have to go and we have to move about. This is all part of an opportunity for God to show you what you need to overcome. So that regardless of what condition you find yourself in because of what he's doing, you will be able to handle it and see the benefit of why he has you in the place that he has you. So you can overcome that subtle influence of the enemy that will try to influence you to move out of that good place God has you in, to go into what you think is a good feeling place, which only leads to your destruction. You know, you should be spending more time and building your relationship with God and getting to know God better, studying his word better, um, but you find other things to do. That's the enemy got you wallowing around and foaming at the mouth and grinding your teeth because he doesn't want you to see what God is really doing for you and how much it works to your well-being. I know the Holy Spirit is going to do what he needs to do because of this word in you. I'm just praying that you have enough love for God to hear him and enough trust and faith with the Holy Spirit to ask him to lead you to follow him. That's what I'm believing, and that's what I know is going to happen. To God be the glory. I want to thank you guys for tuning in today and patiently bearing with me through this process of God teaching us uh, the spiritual aspects of the demonic possession of the little boy so that we don't get so distracted about the rolling around on the ground and the foaming at the mouth and the grinding of the teeth that we miss the real thing that the enemy is trying to influence us in, blinding us to what God is trying to uh, let us see and deafening us from what he's trying to tell us, preventing us from speaking the word in the way of the kingdom in our lives and our service of influence. So there you have it. Another Sunday. Year is almost half gone, but time flies when you're having fun. And I've been having great fun with the Lord. And I pray that you have been too. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Look forward to the next opportunity that God gives me to connect with you. Love you. To God be the glory.